association with the National Gallery of Art, Washington, D.C. Sister Wendy's story of painting. Few people have such a gift of seeing or teaching the times of London. The fascinating story of 800 years of Western painting from the Byzantine era to the present day. Sister Wendy Beckett imparts her love of painting and her impressive knowledge to art lovers and newcomers to the subject alike. More than 450 masterpieces, all reproduced in superb full color, chronicle the movements, developments, and major artists in Western painting from the dawn of art to the present day. Over 200 supporting images, such as photographs, drawings, and documents, place paintings in their historical context. On the inside it says, the story of painting is one that is immensely rich in meaning, yet its value is all too often hidden from us by the complexities of its historians. We must forget the densities of history and simply surrender to the wonder of the story. Sister Wendy Beckett, internationally renowned art historian, Sister Wendy Beckett brings her knowledge, her deep love of art, and her luminous insights to the story of painting, making a difficult subject accessible to newcomers and newly stimulating to all. Sister Wendy Beckett, contributing consultant Patricia Wright. This is a Dorling Kinsley book printed in nineteen ninety four. Let's read a little from the foreword. has long been a passionate concern to me, and I have often been puzzled by media questions as to why this is so and when my interest began. It seems to me that we are all born with the potential to respond to art. Unfortunately, not all of us have the good fortune to have this potential activated, as it were. This book is my faltering attempt to offer the security of a knowledgeable background, which will help to make whatever art we see more accessible. Some people are certainly held back from a fearless gaze at painting because they fear their own ignorance. Truly, to look remains one's personal responsibility, and nobody else's response, and certainly not my own, can be a substitute. But knowledge must come to us from outside, from reading, listening, and viewing. If we know that we know, we can perhaps dare to look. Love and knowledge go hand in hand. When we love, we always want to know, and this book will succeed if it starts the reader on the track that leads to more reading, greater knowledge, greater love, and of course, greater happiness. So we have here several art pieces. Donatello's Florentine Heraldic Lion from 1480 to 20. We have Montagna, and I'm probably gonna not say a lot of 
these names correctly, but I'll try my best. Ceiling fresco in the Gonzaga Palace, circa 1470. We have what looks to be a coin. Pisanello, Duke of Ermini, Portrait Medal, 1445. We have a Van Eyck, Musicians from the Ghent Altarpiece, 1432. And then we have Gentile de Fabriano, The Presentation of the Child in the Temple, 1423. This book has an introduction called Painting Before Giotto. We have a section on Gothic painting. Renaissance, the Northern Renaissance, Baroque and Rococo, Neoclassicism and Romanticism, the Age of Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, the 20th Century. Giotto. Our word history comes by way of Latin from the Greek word historian, which means to narrate, and that word comes from another Greek word, histor, meaning a judge. History not only tells a story, but it passes judgment on it, puts it in order, and gives it meaning. The story of painting is one that is immensely rich in meaning. Yet its value is all too often hidden from us by the complexity of, of its historians. We must forget the densities of history and simply surrender to the wonder of the story. The preface to our story opens with the earliest examples of Western painting, created by our first artistic ancestors, Paleolithic man, from here to Giotto, with whom the story really begins. We pass through the ancient worlds of Egypt and Greece, the great Roman Empire, and the early Christian and Byzantine worlds. And we close with the magnificent illuminated manuscripts created by European monks during the Middle Ages. So we have a painting here. The Revelers from the Tomb of the Leopards, Tarquinia, Italy, circa 470 BC. So we have a couple of Roman figures here with their garlands in their hair, their togas on, their small trees along the walls here. I'm not unsure of what this one is doing because you're kind of missing part of it. You can see where parts of the painting have flaked off the wall. But this one is playing a double flute or musical instrument. You can see they have sandals on. Here it talks about the first paintings. So you have cave paintings, like this one, from Bison from Altamira Cave, circa 15,000 to 12,000 BC. It's 77 inches or 195 centimeters, and that's just the bison length. So from here to here. Cave painting technique. The caves are fully underground and therefore permanently in darkness. Archaeologists have discovered that the artist painted with the aid of small stone lamps filled with animal fat or marrow. The initial designs were engraved into the soft rock or thin lines of paint were blown into the wall through a hollow reed. To make colored paint, the artists used ochre a natural
natural mineral that could be crushed to a powder that would yield red, brown, and yellow pigments, while black may have been from powdered charcoal. Powdered pigments were either rubbed onto the wall with the hands, producing very delicate gradations of tone akin to soft pastel paintings, or mixed with some form of binding fluid, such as animal fat, and applied with crude reed or bristle brushes. The means were simple yet the effect, especially in the strange silence of the cave, is overwhelming. Here we have another, and in this one, it's a bison attacking a man. So you can see its tail here, its hind legs, front legs, bristly back, its horns, and then there's a figure of a person. Cheers of the Bronze Age. 
was the earliest to develop in Europe. Its home was the small island of Crete in the Aegean Sea between Greece and Turkey, and its society developed roughly in parallel to that of its African neighbor, Egypt. Despite their proximity and certain shared influences, Egyptian and Minoan cultures remained very separate, though the latter was to have enormous influence on the art of ancient Greece. Crete formed the center, both culturally and geographically, of the Aegean world. Also in parallel with Minoan civilizations was that of the Cyclades, an Aegean island group. Idols have been recovered from this society, objects whose ancient quasi-neolithic forms are reduced to the barest abstraction, but still retain the magical power of the fetish. Here we have a weird forerunner of the abstract art of our own century, in which the human body is seen in geometrical terms, with an immense raw power, contained and controlled by linear force. Originally, the idols had painted eyes, mouths, and other features. So we have a female idol from Amorgos, an island in the Cyclades, Archipelago now part of Greece, circa 2000 BC. It's very sharp lines. The head is a triangle as well as the nose. The shoulders are very angled and the elbows. The legs are also quite straight. Minoan and Mycenaean art. Minoan art is largely represented by its carvings and painted pottery and it is not until 1500 BC, during the Great Palace Period, that we see paintings at all, and generally these have only survived in fragments. Although a certain degree of Egyptian stylization is apparent in the schematic repetition of human figures, for instance, Minoan representation reveals a naturalism and suppleness largely absent in Egyptian art. The Minoans took inspiration from nature, and their art exhibits an astonishing degree of realism. They were a seafaring civilization, and their paintings reflected their knowledge of the oceans and of sea creatures such as dolphins. We have a fresco with dolphins from the Palace of Knossos, Crete, 1500 to 1450 BC. A funeral mask from the royal tombs at Mycenae, circa 1500 BC. Here, also from the palace, is Doriador Fresco, and it's a restored detail. I'm not sure if these are maybe acrobats. You have a person here on their arms and wrists, and a loincloth, and shoes, and then you have another person here, upside down on the back of a bull, and then you have another one out front that has their hands on the horns of the bull. Maybe this is like an early rodeo. <laughs> And the decorative border. Greece's new vision. Like their Cretan predecessors, the Greeks were far less conscious of the tomb than the Egyptians. They have left us a number of bronze statuettes, which are highly esteemed, but their painting, an art on which their writers assure us they lavished great skill, is almost totally lost. One of the reasons for this is that unlike the Egyptians, the Minoans, and the Mycenaeans, who painted only murals, the Greeks painted mainly on wooden panels that have perished over time. The Roman scholar Pliny the Elder, AD 23 to 24 through 79, whose detailed descriptions of Greek painting in the ancient world greatly influenced 
influenced successive generations, is the major source of information on Greek painting. Here we have a young girl gathering flowers. It's very lightly colored green background. Tall flowers behind as she's walking along. In her Luminous robes of white. She has a cornucopia looking basket in her hands with the flowers inside. A wall painting from the Villa of Livia near Rome, which depicts an outdoor garden with a rock or brick wall. fruit in the trees. We have a specimen here that looks like a conifer of some sort. More fruit trees. We have Roman portraiture. The wall painting known as the baker and his wife. 26. A first century work from Pompeii is now thought not to portray a baker, but a lawyer and his wife. Archaeologists are still trying to establish who owned the house in which this mural was found. But whoever this young couple was, the portrait remains essentially Roman, with all the interest concentrated on their personalities. The husband, a slightly uncouth, gawky, earnest young man, looks at the viewer with anxious appeal, while the wife looks away into the distance, musing and holding her writing stylus to her delicately pointed chin. Both seem lonely, as if their differently directed gazes reveal something of their marriage. They live together, but they do not share their lives, and there is an added poignancy. The house of Neo, whatever his profession may prove to be, we do know that this was the name of the building in which the painting was situated, was still unfinished at the time of the eruption, so it's possible that this lonely marriage was of tragically short duration. So here you have the gentleman. Short cropped hair. Brown eyes. Looks like he's holding a scroll under his chin. This is white robes. And his wife. Some red robes. And she looks like she's holding a stylus, but also there's something else in front of her that she's holding. And then she has her hair tied back with a headband, her brown eyes. Here we have a mummy case and portrait from Fayum, Egypt, 2nd century AD. You can see this red case with gold depictions of Egyptian at the top, framing the portrait face of the person buried inside as the garland across their hair as a band. Roman sculpture. Long after the ancient Roman civilization had disappeared, example of its sculpture have continued to be visible in all parts of the empire. In Rome itself, the great narrative reliefs on Trajan's column and the Arch of Titus in the Forum were on display to visitors and inhabitants of the city. Trajan's column is 
is as tall as a ten-story building and stands on a pedestal two stories high. It was built in AD 113 to honor the Emperor Trajan, a gilded statue of whom, replaced in the 16th century by a statue of St. Peter, of course, was placed at the top. The marble outer surface of the column is carved into the likeness of a scroll that twists in a spiral up the column. The scroll is more than 600 feet, or 180 meters in length, and contains over 2,500 human figures. It shows a series of scenes from Trajan's triumphant campaigns in Dacia, the present-day Romania. The examples shown on this page depict soldiers and builders at work, constructing the walls of a fortification. The reliefs are shallow and have a painterly feel to them. They make up a continuous and clearly intelligible narrative, leading the reader through 150 episodes in succession. During the 16th century, the carvings on this column were an important inspiration an influence for the artists of the Renaissance, who regarded the column's dense carvings as an idealized, three-dimensional demonstration of what two-dimensional art was really about. So here we have a portion of the column, and there's people going about their daily business. It looks like they're building this wall. And here it looks like soldiers heading out to war, maybe, with their horses and their shields. Then the wall behind them. Early Christian and medieval art. The first golden age. Byzantine art. In 313, after 300 years of Christian persecution, the Emperor Constantine recognized the Christian Church as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Early Christian art differed from the Greco-Roman tradition in subject matter more than style. Later in the East, it evolved into Byzantine art. As artists turned away from Greco-Roman style, to develop an entirely new style. The importance of Byzantine art is seen in its profound influence on Gothic art. It was the first part of a tradition that was to remain predominantly Christian and was to run right through the Middle Ages to the time of the Renaissance. So here we have a wall painting from Catacombs of Rome, 3rd century. 10 and a half by 16 inches or 27 by 40 centimeters. Then you have a person in a robe, coverings down to their ankles, and a scarf, their hands up looking up into the sky. And here you have Justinian and his attendants from the Great Cycle mosaics at the Church of San Vital, Ravenna, circa 526 to 547. So you have men here in their robes, one carrying an incense burner, others carrying different icons of the church. And here Justinian and his gold halo as they often have in these types of paintings or mosaics. Lavish decorations on his robe. And then you have the soldiers over here with their spears and a large shield. On the front, there's a symbol. More church art. This one is from the cathedral at Montreal, 
Sicily, circa 1190. How ornate and gold. We have a Vladimir Madonna here with child. Russian art. Russia was converted to Christianity in the 10th century and eventually took over Byzantine tradition, making it very much its own. The most exquisite example of this meeting of two very dissimilar cultures at the highest point in the development of Russian Byzantine art is surely this vivid trinity painted by Andrei Rublev. Rublev is the most famous of Russian icon painters. The figures represent the three angels that appeared to Abraham in the Old Testament. This is grace made visible, and it is this Byzantine heritage that gives special poignancy to the mysterious works of El Greco 300 years later. So you must have the three angels here. And this is painted in reds. Western Europe. Despite its pejorative implication, the phrase Dark Ages is sometimes used to refer to early Middle Ages in European civilization up to the beginning of the High Middle Ages around 1100. The thousand year period from 400 to 1400 was a time of gradual mingling of influences from the Greco Roman tradition, Christianity, and Byzantine art as well as the growing Celtic and Germanic cultures of the North. Far from being, as well as growing Celtic and Germanic cultures of the North, far from being an artistically barren or regressive period, filling the empty space between the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, as was believed for centuries, it was a period of development and metamorphosis here we have a depiction of St. Matthew from Arley Golden Gospels, circa 800. Celtic Illumination The missionary zeal of the Christian Church, which spread its influence across Europe, is seen at its most intense in the relatively tiny Christian stronghold of Celtic Ireland which had converted to Christianity in the 5th century. Advanced Celtic monastic communities were also established in Britain and Northern Europe. The intricate art that was created in all these communities reveals a blend of Celtic and Germanic styles. In their convoluted manner, the Celtic manuscripts appeal to us across the centuries with a remarkable intensity. Chiro page from the Lindisfarne Gospels, circa 690. All the colors, you have reds and pinks and yellows and greens and oranges and teals and the Celtic cross symbols in here. Lots of fill Illuminated initials. The true glory of the Book of Kells is in the illuminated initials. So that must be what these are here. And then up here from the Book of Kells, 38 symbols of evangelists, circa 800. It's interesting because you have 
a human face here with wings, maybe like an angel with a staff. And then the others are of animal heads. I'm not sure what this one is, but this one is definitely a horse with a cross above their head, almost like a unicorn with wings. And the legs are sideways. And then here we have a bird, looks like a bird of prey with a large beak and wings. Interesting. Oh, and here's another large example of the Chiro with these large letterings that are so intricate and beautiful. This one even has a human head <laughs> twirling on the inside here. Lots of just little symbols, like there's two people here, looks like one here, and a large lettering outlined, very intricate. Fitting is 
is supposed to be chain mail. They're in large rings, though. Some soldiers are falling. Others have just their shields. A few lying about. And then you have very decorative writing. At the beginning of important words, they made large capital letters. Very ornate. Some ivy down along the bottom edges. And then they have pictures in certain places along the book. French Illumination. A lovely missile, a book of text for church services through the year. Survives from the 14th century at the Abbey of St. Denis in Paris. It is by a follower of Jean Poussel, an illuminator with a workshop in Paris. One page shows liturgical texts for the feast and day of St. Denis. So that's what this one is here. With a magnificent pictorial O and two other miniatures telling of the saint's relationships with the royal family. Even if we do not know the legends about the stag that hid in a church when pursued by Prince Dagobert and how the prince and his father, King Clotaire, are eventually reconciled through a dream appearance of St. Denis, we can still enjoy the pale and meticulous figurines living out their holy adventures in the Missal. Okay, so up here there's a stag. Must be the prince running after it through the church. There's a child here, alone. And then a person laying with the angels or the St. Dennis, maybe, appearing. Romanesque painting. In an illustration in a mid century French Bible Morales A. Biblical text with moralizing commentary. God the Father is seen as an architect. This work shows the increasing return to the natural looking style of Roman art. So they, um, I think this is gold leaf back here. And then they with a blue robe and a red scarf wrapped around with a compass in the hand and then creating worlds or something there. And then we have this is the illustration from the Ancient of Days, 1794. And this god is leaning over, white-haired, looks like bright sun behind them, pointing this way and that. He's creating things. Classical influences. Other works that can be seen to prefigure Giotto's naturalism include the paintings and mosaics of the Italian artist Pietro Cavallini, active 1273-1308. He worked mainly in Rome, and Giotto would have seen examples of his art there early in his career. Cavallini's style was strongly influenced by classical Roman art. Unfortunately, his work has been preserved for us, for the most part, only in fragments. So here's one example of Pietro Cavallini's The Last Judgment. You can see some things have faded or are missing. This one is holding something in their hand. But there are parts that are Luminous robes, lots of light reflecting, greens and browns and tans and golds. Gothic painting. I think we'll stop here and we can start here the next time.
so glad you could join me to take a look at Sister Wendy's story of painting. And I hope you found it relaxing and interesting. There's a lot more to cover in this book, so we'll come back and visit this at some point in the future. But as always, I hope that you're taking care of yourself and sleeping.